On the other side of toxic Christianity, I found myself faced with one question. Now what? This podcast is about that question. We have conversations with folks who are asking themselves the same things. We're picking up the pieces of a fractured and fragmented faith. We're finding treasure in what the church called trash, beauty, and solidarity in people and places we were told to fear, reject, and dismiss. I'm Tammy Spencer-Helms, and this is Life After Leaven. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Life After Leaven. Um, I'm Tammy Spencer-Helms, your host, and I'm super excited to have one of my bestest friends here, the one and only Aaron Cole. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us who you are, Mm -hmm. uh, what you're doing, and what life looks like for you now that you've unleavened. Mm. Yes, Lord. It's so great to be back in the seat with you. Um, Yes, I go by Erin Corey Cole these days. My pronouns are they or she. Mm -hmm. I am coming to you from a beautiful home where I can see the water from my windows Mm -hmm. that I bought with my platonic life partner, one of my best (laughs) friends. We're two solo parents raising four kids. Um, And... There's a lot to be shared about life unleavened and Mm. the journey began similar to where you pick up the book with Trayvon, Mm -hmm. um, which is how many years ago now? Is that 2012? Yeah, it was about 11 11 years ago. Yeah. 11 years ago on the 26th. Yeah, exactly. Um, I am... I co-parent my kids with my wonderful former husband. I came out um, living my fullest queer life. Um, Mm -hmm. I do LGBTQ inclusion work in a faith-based institution of higher education. And I'm still a birth doula. So I'm still coming alongside folks in the middle of the night, swaying and breathing and (laughs) helping them in their hours. Um, and spiritually, I'm on a hell of a ride. So I'm yeah. really excited to talk with you about yeah. what just, yeah, it, it's, I mean, it's been two years since you and I recorded a podcast mm-hmm. together, which is yes. mind blowing that that much yes. time has passed. Yeah. And it was downhill from there. I know. Been? Can we share about that last episode? Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah, come on, talk about it. I well, mean, we, we did an episode on, what was even the episode about? I think we went on a tangent, right? Was it Some, binaries? Binaries was one. It was probably binaries. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. then we did one, should I say should? Mm-hmm. And then I don't know. All I know is that mm-hmm. after one of our episodes, I was getting emails that were basically saying we can no longer support your mm-hmm. work. Uh, we can yeah. no longer support what subculture is doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was you know, really in response to, I mean, they copied one of our, I don't even remember which one it was. It was so long ago, but one of our um, episodes where we were talking about sexuality Mm -hmm. and um, I was, I don't remember if I was divorced yet. Was I divorced yet? Yeah. Yes. At least separated. separated If it was two years ago. Yeah. 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 Um, And so, yeah, yeah, I was definitely divorced. It was like, (laughs) So, um, yeah, I was thinking about that and we were talking about how I was being encouraged to have a holy hoe phase and whether or not I was going to enter into a hoe phase or not, which didn't end up working out. (laughs) (laughs) I fell in love with the first person I dated. Uh, so that was interesting, but like, yeah, can you, do you remember anything from that talk or kind of like, yeah, I mean that, that podcast episode was like, I didn't know it then, but I think it was one or two weeks out from when I would separate from from my then husband. So it was, it's so wild. I have gone back just one time to listen to it and you can hear, I can hear just knowing me and what was going on in my heart and in my body at that time, I can just hear the tension. And Mm -hmm. I describe it now of like, she hulking my way out of these systems in successive years, left the church in 2019, left ministry in 2020. Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. sadly, I uh, had to leave my marriage in 2021. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, it's a really poignant episode. And it is funny because you and I were part of a ministry organization that like invited one of our mutual friends to speak at this missions yeah. conference and all these donors shat on it. And then in our own like little ripple in our little way, yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that, you know, that, um, that conference yeah. in that moment 
when white supremacy was being called out on a stage in front mm-hmm. of a white evangelical, mm-hmm. you know, conference. Right. Like these are just, I call them portals. Like mm-hmm. these are moments uh, that completely rearrange the status quo. It's a mm-hmm. door that you walk through mm-hmm. and you won't be the same again. So Everything changes. <laughs> yeah, I should have called it a portal between Trayvon and, and yeah. George Floyd. Because essentially, yeah, it's it's very interesting that you bring that up because I talk about that um, in the Black on My Own Time chapter mm-hmm. where it seemed to me that I was out enough of whiteness that everything was kind of like okay everything was going fine uh until the response of those donors to someone speaking about white supremacy from a main stage at a national conference Mm -hmm. and so just so everyone knows that's my dog beacon in the background (laughs) my family and my daughter so when you record it in the evenings this is what you get it's beautiful Um, so it gets litty around here after three (laughs) o'clock just so you know um but yeah, and I remember being being at that conference and thinking about how it felt like a concession to me. It felt mm-hmm. like, you know, after that conference, not even, you know, three months later, they're coming out with these papers, right, um, about human sexuality. And it forced a lot of people out and it forced a lot of people to um, really have to deal with situations they weren't ready for. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I, I remember that time and we were, we worked together at the time we were mm-hmm. colleagues. And yes. so I guess my question is, you know, when you're thinking about your own unleavening process, tell me a little bit about that. Um, having guests on the show that are mm-hmm. either in the process of doing that, have done that and can actually talk about what it looks like on the other side mm-hmm. of that. Yeah. So like, what does life and faith look like for you on mm-hmm. the other side of whiteness mm-hmm. or, you know, the leaven that I'm yes. talking about yes. in the book? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Um, So for me, it has looked like taking a long, undetermined break from the church, Mm -hmm. uh, the Christian church. Uh, I I attended a church service actually last week, but it was like part of an exposure therapy assignment Mm -hmm. from my therapist. And it was an explicitly anti-racist, queer affirming Mm -hmm. sort of evangelical church in Washington, D.C. And I just Mm -hmm. sat in the back. Yeah. And I, my whole body was in fight or flight. <laughs> I remember the slides had the same typeface that ours did at the church I helped plant for their tithing. And oh, really? they called different systems the same thing. But at the front, there was a trans woman, a beautiful black woman, throwed out a soft butch on drums, all leading mm-hmm. worship and all leading these worship songs that we mm-hmm. had sung in our ministry yeah. organization that mm-hmm. I had sung at church. Um And it was Mm -hmm. so beautiful. I'm just like flashing forward to that scene because being someone who helped plant a church, who was a professional Christian for 10 years Mm -hmm. um, and felt so much um, betrayal, uh, complex PTSD, um, dissociation, disembodiment, to sit there and to sit there and gaze with love at my siblings and to say, I'm so glad you have this. And I know that this space is not for me, at least not right, right now. Definitely. So I'm sort of on a um, spiritual pilgrimage right now yeah. with the mystics and the wisdom traditions. Mm-hmm. And that includes Jesus. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I think for me, once I lifted the uh, veil of colonialism, like the mm-hmm. cloak over what we now mm-hmm. call Christianity, there was no going back. Right. Um, and it doesn't mean that I may not return to Christianity as home base. I don't know yet. I'm mm-hmm. just sort of a sojourner, I guess, right. on the way right now. Um, right. So and, do you yeah. think that, like, when you think about Christianity, like now, like, I've been struggling, you know, the, the you know, the whole title of this whole season is kind of like, now what? Like, yeah. what do you do? Yeah. Do you see us returning to that, even that title? of being a Christian or like where are your thoughts around that? I've been asking myself that. Yeah. So I think some people can, and some people are who I know. Um, I just know for me, not right now. Um, I, I still hold on to Jesus in my, as like, uh, I do refer to myself as a Jesus, witch, as this moniker, um, that combines the divine feminine and the divine masculine. Um, okay. I think at their I'm best. I'm sure you've gotten lots of feedback about that. Yes. And I don't, this is the first time saying that publicly. So we'll see what mm. kind of feedback I get from that. Yeah. If people oh, listen. Mm-hmm. 
Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, I don't think that I, I know good, faithful, radical people on the inside who still have stamina to mm-hmm. challenge and to overturn and to subvert. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's taken me a long time to give myself permission that it's yeah. not me and it doesn't mm-hmm. have to be me. Um, mm-hmm. And in some ways I have one foot in and one foot out because I still work at a religious institution. It's a totally mm-hmm. different stream of Christianity. So that yeah. creates a little distance for me. Um right. But I don't feel I no longer am holding myself responsible um, to continue to be traumatized in yes. in hopes that I can be a part of the wave of change. Yes. And there's some white savior shit in there for me. There's all kinds of yes. and also some like I think what has kept me in those spaces is my whiteness is being like, I know that I have privilege and power to steward here. So how, mm-hmm. you know, can I hang on a little bit longer? Mm-hmm. Um, can I challenge a little bit longer? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm, I think just in my personal spirituality, like I, so I still have a foot in the game, so I'm not like yeah. completely out, but in my Pretty personal much. spirituality right now, it's taking a long break uh, yeah. from most things Christian, except the mystics, except the weird yeah. ones. Cause I, I dig them. <laughs> I dig so in the, it's like you're taking a break from the institution. I and, am. And like digging into the, I've been reading a lot of like Neil Douglas Klotz mm. uh, recently and, and learning about Aramaic and it's been mm. fascinating. And that's where I kind of find myself too, because I'm not able to really, you know, I, I people ask me now and mm-hmm. I say, well, I'm, I'm just chasing light. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So far in that process, I have not, had to stop chasing Jesus. Yes. Um, and so when it comes to that point, we'll see what happens. But mm-hmm. white Jesus and the light mm-hmm. were incompatible. Yes. And so I, I find that like there has not been, I remember thinking, you know, that I had come to sort of something like a fork mm-hmm. in the road and it, it just was never a fork. Yeah. It was just a non-existent choice. Yeah. Um, and that has been really helpful in terms of talking to people about it. And I mean, I'm thinking about, you know, how much work you've done with white people Mm -hmm. um, and kind of talking to them about this leaven of whiteness. Um, Can you talk a little more about what like white people do? Like what does unleavening, you know, for white people, for me, it looks like coming into my own blackness. Yes, totally. Recognizing that as a divine thing, a divine deliberate choice. Yeah. Um, for how it would live and move in the world. But for you, um, as you think about, you know, unleavening as people who have read the book and who are thinking about what that process looks like for them, like talk to me a little bit about what that looks like. Yes. So I'm trying to go back to different phases and stages of this process. I think initially when I was still identifying primarily as a Christian, it, it was taking a long undefined break from white male voices and white female voices um, and really immer- emerging, immersing, immersing myself um, in Black and Indigenous theo- theological spaces, embodiment, um, learning more about Asian and American spirituality. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was a good chunk of time to just mm-hmm. start to retrain the neuropathways in my brain mm-hmm. that whiteness and white theology was not objective or neutral and didn't have to be the default. Mm -hmm. So I can't be black and I can't be indigenous and I'm Mm -hmm. happy and nourished to be a descendant of Northern Europeans. Mm -hmm. Um, But I have to unlearn. um, Mm -hmm. So I had to unlearn some of those Eurocentric ways of relating to God. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. then, and now it's taken me to get this place where I'm finally able to explore some Celtic spirituality, Celtic Christianity, um, really trying to see what what my ancestors can can give me and what Mm -hmm. I can, uh, what mantle I can pick up there. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I am on some multi-generational spiritual shit right now with the divine feminine, building some altars in my home. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, so not appropriating spiritual legacies that aren't mine when Mm -hmm. engaging with other modes, trying to do so thoughtfully and in like a culturally Mm -hmm. sensitive way. Mm -hmm. But I I hang out with a group of folks. We have a weekly phone call called white people prayer and (laughs) we've been doing it the whole time. It's been the thread since my very last staff conference with the ministry org we worked for until now Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where 
at that staff, staff conference, me and a Hawaiian indigenous sister got on stage and asked white people to repent. <laughs> and we were like ushered off stage. <laughs> oh my goodness. So, that's when white people prayer was birthed <laughs> and it's basically it's like an aa meeting it's like an alcoholics yeah. anonymous for whiteness so there's a confessional aspect where we go around and share like where we're at um yeah. with wrestling and grappling with our own whiteness we mm-hmm. start every meeting by 15 minutes of silence grounding and body work because mm-hmm. the demon of white supremacy is always trying to separate soul from body mm-hmm. always right. always always so we get into our bodies and lately we were doing like a potluck where everyone can share um uh so a nugget that's nourishing them some it could be yeah. something from celtic spirituality it could be a feast day it could be um a mantra uh and then we usually end with cole arthur riley's black liturgies oh. to yeah. to just pray uh under the mantle and in, in submission to black female wow. uh, wisdom thinkers and, you know, wow. folks. So it's a powerful time. <laughs> and I think we're trying to learn how to be in community as white people that doesn't, um, that that is challenging white supremacy. We yeah. can't help but perpetuate it in some ways. So I don't think we can claim that when we gather, we're not perpetuating it, but we have mm-hmm. to learn how to be with our people in ways that are yeah. healthy and fruitful. So mm-hmm. that's what we're trying to do over there. And that's yeah. been very, very that. nourishing. Yeah. 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 That has helped. So, and I want to ask you about, um, you could ask me, I want to yeah. ask you questions. Um, that space has helped challenge what I think, happens to a lot of ex evangelical white folks, which is hyper individualism, um, right. that there's not a collective nature of that. And so I wanted to ask you because you're using the word unleavening white Christians use the word deconstruction. And there's been a lot of discourse between black and white post Christian people of like what these processes look like. So how has that looked different for you in your yeah. blackness? And yeah. yeah. So I think, I think deconstru- the problem has been like, I think being black is the, the heritage and the ancestry that I have of a group of people who um, had already resisted whiteness in the theology for the most part. Right. Yeah. And there are even, you know, there are even debates about whether the enslaved um, all really embrace Christianity or if it was just one of those things of like, yeah, we'll, <laughs> we're going to combine some of our, and actually it's, it is true that a lot of the things that came over from Africa was kind of infused into this new expression over here in the States. But what's beautiful about that for me is that I find a lot of white people when they deconstruct, deconstruct out of faith a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that has a lot to do with the tethering that that exists in my bones and in my blood yes. to uh, a history and a legacy of a Jesus that makes a way and of a Jesus who delivers and of a Jesus who opens doors. And um, so to me, I think that there's a richness in being a black person in this sort of ex-evangelical deconstruction movement that is saying like, hey, actually, I want to frame this differently um, because there's nothing wrong with the bread. The bread has gotten a lot of my people through a lot <laughs> of things. Yes. Right? Lots yes. of oppressed people. I think of Oscar Mar- Romero and like, you know, these theologies that come from mystics, that come from folks from the East. Um, a lot of those folks you know, they didn't have to necessarily extract the same things that I have to extract. And so because of that, there's still a significant amount of sustenance left for me in terms of thinking about Jesus. Um, In the book, I talk about it like crumbs, like the crumbs were really, they, I thought they would be enough, you know, for Mm -hmm. life Um, Mm -hmm. because I did have real experiences and real fascination with Jesus. Um, And I think that that part has been, this weird sort of um, tethering uh, for me uh, because I know that uh, for a lot of white folks, there's not a rootedness in anything. That's um, yes. When you, when you, it's like d- the dies in the water. When you start becoming aware of white supremacy and Christianity, there is nothing left because you mm-hmm. keep pulling that thread. And 
the whole carpet mm-hmm. falls apart, except for maybe these ancient traditions like Celtic Christianity. And right, right, but right. then, but then those are being co-opted by white supremacists who are like, oh, mm-hmm. Viking faith, you know. So you're always just like, ah, like where do I, where do I go, you know? Where yeah. do we go? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm finding that there's got to be. I know that oh, my sister-in-law. Uh, one of the things that she's done, if, if for those who don't know, I married a white, um, and so my <laughs> sister-in-law has like gotten back to like praying in German, which is the the typical like their actual tongue, right? And so, but when my sister-in-law prays in German, it's very rich to me um, because there's a connection there that she has with where she's actually from, the tribe she's actually from, you know, mm-hmm. and bringing that to bear on her. And I'm probably going to have uh, probably have her on the show to talk a little bit more about that. But like even her as a white person talking to me about coming back into understanding with the land, understanding that I have ancestors. Yes. <laughs> And who were they and what yes. did they think about God and yes. how did they frame and, you know, yeah, that's right. um, worship even. Yes. And, and so I think yes. that there is hope for white folks. It's just such a like steep climb mm-hmm. uh, because it's the air and the water, right? Mm-hmm. Like white, white supremacy is in everything. Yes. Um, and so you really, the unleavening process feels to me like a progressive and continuous process, mm-hmm. whereas deconstruction definitely feels like, mm-hmm. okay, I deconstructed and I'm done. Right. 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 To me, I'm, I recognize that there's whiteness mm-hmm. all around me. And mm-hmm. so I'm always going to have to be aware that I might have to go through this process again. Yes. Um, and I might end up somewhere completely different than I am now. Yes. Um, but the way that I like to frame my faith is as a faith that is, uh, that is unleavened and is being unleavened. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I mean by the leaven, obviously, is the whiteness mm-hmm. um, yeah. because that's where the toxin is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just had a thought that um, because white folks have no home anymore um, mm-hmm. in this sort of post colonial mm-hmm. space, um, what that will take for us it is co creative mm-hmm. and white mm-hmm. supremacy thrives on fear and anxiety mm-hmm. and isolation and control. Mm-hmm. So I think I can tell, I can tell that I'm in like a multi-part journey and I'm just trusting the process yeah. that I am so in a relationship with my body right now. Mm-hmm. And the whole time, like spirit led me and I caused harm in all kinds of directions. So yes. I'm not like blaming God for my yeah. fleshy harm shit, mm-hmm. but Spirit led me all the way and is leading me all the way. But what needs to, I think that's why there is some deconstruction or maybe there's another word for it, but what needs to come off of us are these characteristics of white supremacy Mm -hmm. and learning how like creativity and fear Mm -hmm. are not good buddies. So Mm -hmm. if we're co-creating a faith uh, mm-hmm. that doesn't rely on white supremacy and doesn't rely on our power and our comfort and our control. Mm-hmm. There's a lot to undo. Yes. Who, do, who do we go to? We go to the East, we go to the divine feminine, we go to ancient wisdom traditions, and hopefully respectfully, we can go to indigenous cultures, black and mm-hmm. brown folks and sit at their feet and learn. Because I, I always remember this tension of watching my black friends in in the same spaces and being like, yeah, if this was if th- if there was sustenance here for folks to endure chattel slavery, like who the f am I to be you know to be like I poo poo this and it's no longer useful, you know? I was like, oh, this is such a mind f. Like, yeah. what yeah. know, what do we do with this? So yeah. I, I think I mean, at least exactly. in my journey, it's like a round circle. I gotta go all the way around. And, mm-hmm. and we'll see. I do, and I appreciate you saying that because I think there is a relative amount of popularity in being you know, ex-Christian or ex-evangelical. And what you'll find is that those people are still as problematic as they were in the evangelical spaces because they haven't done the anti-racism work. And they haven't done the actual unleavening work of recognizing whiteness, knowing what it looks like, knowing how it shows up Mm -hmm. and extracting it. That's right. And refusing and resisting it. And I think that's why it's like been a very interesting Mm. journey. I mean, it came up for me even in writing where Mm. it was like, like I have to make sure I'm not writing for the white gaze, right? Yes. Like I'm not writing this story to convince or impress white people. Yes. Oh. I'm writing the story because it's mine, right? And um, and so I do know some of the things that 
I cared about during that time. And so I try to be sensitive to those things that I, you know, think are important for folks who are trying to figure out whether or not to stay or go (laughs) um, in some of these uh, spaces. Uh, And so I try to be sensitive to that and speak to some of the concerns that they might have. But it was it was difficult to Mm -hmm. not feel like, well, you know, picturing white people, white men in my head as I'm writing and thinking, well, is this thorough enough? Is this convincing enough? Um, and it, it was just really kind of a weird, uh, was haunted by white Jesus, even mm. while I was writing about, you know, mm. leaving him. <laughs> oh. Oh. So it was a really interesting mm. process. Um, and I, I'm thankful mm. for kind mm. of having you, I think, what I'm thankful for is I have the best white people in my life now, right? Like there's no, I have no question about um, whether or not the white people in my life are aware of whiteness, hate whiteness and are actively seeking to resist and Mm -hmm. extract it. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, Mm -hmm. and that's a beautiful place to be. I find myself in community because we have a common enemy. Yeah. And I think, yeah. That's what was missing yeah. before is yeah. that even the people who heard our podcast and, you know, whatever, um, we don't have the, the same common enemy. And I think mm-hmm. that that's why we don't agree on a lot. That's so um, well said. That's yeah. so well said. Yeah. I think about Audre Lorde's uh, mm-hmm. just exhortation to not try to use the master's tools to get us mm-hmm. out of this. And there is such liberation that comes when you realize like, like you were having that moment of, is this thorough enough? Is this, and it, there is such liberation to be like that paradigm cannot get to where we're going. Mm-hmm. So, and, and that has been a refrain that's really helped me form a secure attachment with God is like, we, with all the love for the humanity of the people I have left, I don't want to live their life anymore. I don't want to participate in that way of being. I don't want to assess uh, objectives and measure them in the way that I have been taught because Mm -hmm. the fruit has not been good. So Mm -hmm. if we're trying to get somewhere new, we got to do something different. Exactly right. Like we have to pursue different modalities. We can't do it with the same measuring stick. Mm -hmm. which is very freeing. Um, I still have a lot of healing around white men to, Mm -hmm. to go. I know that that's coming for me. Um, Mm -hmm. But I am starting like the first fruits of forgiveness have been uh, springing up Mm -hmm. and that has been really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, A forgiveness that doesn't feel threatening. I think forgiveness has felt very threatening for a long time and I have not been ready. Um, Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But I I think my point is this is a wilderness. At least all I can share is my own story that I had to get as far away as possible Mm -hmm. to start to rebuild a sense of self again outside Mm -hmm. of these systems and ideologies and relationships Mm-hmm. That now with a more secure foundation, now I like I, I envision in five years, I will be able to hold so many tensions that I was not able to hold before that mm-hmm. just felt like I have to run in the opposite way. Because mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. believe in a politic of disposability. I don't I think, think that people are disposable. Right. right? So as we leave these old wineskins, there's yes. still human beings involved yes. in all these systems that are loved and divine. You know, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. so I feel very hopeful again, just trusting the process, trusting creator and taking literally just the next right step. That's been yes. the mantra. Let me take yeah. the next right step. Um, wow. And where that's, that's so funny that you, uh, you said that because I'm, I'm trying to end every podcast with uh, three things. Uh, so like, sorry, I muted myself. Uh, I'm trying to end each podcast with like three things from each guest. The first is what are you bringing? So what I mean by what are you bringing is what are you taking with you from the time before you unleavened? What is there anything coming with you that's worth keeping and using to rebuild? Mm -hmm. So that's one. What are you bringing? What are you binging? So is there a show or a series or a book or an album that you're binging right now? What are you binging? Uh, It can be anything. Um, And then the last question would be, what are some words to live by? I love that. Um, 
So that would be my three questions for you, Aaron. I love that. Head on out of the episode. Oh my gosh. Uh, what are you bringing? Okay. What are you binging? I love and it. What are some words to live by. I have immediate answers to all three. I don't know how that yeah. happened. So, what I am bringing is birth, death, and resurrection over mm. and over and over again. Mm. That, um, that Easter imprint, that that pattern that mm-hmm. is everywhere all at once is so mm-hmm. powerful. Um, mm-hmm. Birth, death, and resurrection. Bringing it with me. Can't take that from me. Okay. Um, I am binging the original L word and oh. damn, is it depressing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the first, the very, very first season. The, the first generation, not this recent oh. one. Like <laughs> I feel like I have to catch up on so much of queer culture that was just like yeah. in the banned book section of the library for so many years. The naughty list. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> But I have to remind myself, like, just because this was the lesbian show does not mean this is, like, ideal. <laughs> because yeah. it's really, like, spiritually tough to get through. So Really? Yeah. Wow. It just It's just unhealthy. It's just, it's problematic racially. It's problematic for trans folks. Like, and yeah. I think just relationally, the thing is, it, it's honest. It's honest right. with some of the things that stereotypes are built off from the sapphic mm-hmm. community. But, yeah. Um, so I'm I'm working on a puzzle, and I'll either pour myself a beer or like a CBD seltzer and just take it one nice. episode at a time. So awesome. that's what uh, I'm binging right now. Awesome. Um, words to live by. I think I shared this with you on the phone the other day. The the mantra that is my prayer every day right now is, "What is in the way is the way." Mm. Um, I wish, I think it's maybe Margaret O'Malley might be the credit. I don't think I'm getting that right. But um, what's in the way is the way. That which I am frustrated with and I wish would just unobstruct my blazing path forward is probably going to be the vehicle for more healing, more learning, more growth, if I can lean into it um, and surrender a little bit more. So wow. I'm yeah. hearing you. I'm hearing and thinking about all we talked about today and thinking that is a perfect mantra to kind of like banner over our conversation. <laughs> What's in the way is the way. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cause I've watched you pick up pieces and uh, do it so beautifully and so honestly. And I'm just, I'm just grateful to know you, friend. Thank you. And that we're, we're still in this together. We're still here. We're still here. And all of it, I mean, you're married. You have a spouse. You have a yes. dog. You have a child. Like, yes. it's all so... of whom you probably met in the background noises. <laughs> but it's, yeah, it's, it's so beautiful. It's... I'm excited for the space you're creating on this podcast because yes. that it is the ache of our generation. Um, Mm -hmm. specifically at the intersections that you hold Mm -hmm. in your blackness, in your queerness, what is the way forward? So Mm -hmm. let's find out together. It's beautiful. It's awesome. (sighs) Thankful for you. Just so y'all know, I'm going to have Aaron on here a lot. I (laughs) I miss co-hosting with you. Life life has changed and we're busy. So we have a recurring guest, but I just really love you. Love what you bring to the table. Love what you bring to the world, the Mm -hmm. earth. Um, Thank you. And I appreciate you. So thanks, everybody, for uh, joining us. We'll holler. (laughs) On the other side of toxic Christianity, I found myself faced with one question. Now what? This podcast is about that question. We have conversations with folks who are asking themselves the same things. We're picking up the pieces of a fractured and fragmented faith. We're finding treasure in what the church called trash, beauty and solidarity in people and places we were told to fear, reject and dismiss. I'm Tammy Spencer Helms and this is Life After Levin.